All right, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, so that you know, we are opening the partition, so we'll have a lot more sitting in the back. And uh, before we get started, let me introduce myself. My name is Raul Reis. I have the honor as, of serving as the Dean of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication, okay? Applause for the Journalism School. And thank you all for being here at this event. Uh, this is very much a social media event, so that you know. The hashtag is SGMC underscore Hearst. You can see the hashtag on the corner, the right-hand corner over there. Uh, we have official tweeters here who will be tweeting on behalf of the school. We have also, we are live streaming this event. If you, if you are live streaming or following us on the internet, thank you for your participation. Uh, PBS Media Shift is live blogging the event, so they will be watching the broadcast and blogging as we go as part of the Media Shift uh, project. And uh, so we want you very much to be engaged in this event and be a part of it. And we have about 30 high school students here today who are reporting on the event. Raise your hand if you're a high school student from MAST. There we go. And obviously we have a lot of journalism and mass communication students who are also here. And uh, some of them had to rearrange their schedules so that they had to make sure that they could be here. We appreciate that. And I think you understand the importance of the event. Uh, so welcome, welcome again to community members, everybody who is here, to our beautiful campus uh, of Florida International University, Biscayne Bay campus. Uh, this is our, today we are hosting here the Hearst Distinguished Lecture Series. This is our big event in the fall, and we have invited uh, and wanted to extend a welcome to our speaker today, Martin Barron, who is the executive editor of the Washington Post. But before we get started with this lecture, I would like to make sure that I thank the Hearst Foundation for its generosity in making this event happen, and the SGMC faculty who serve on the Hearst Distinguished Lecture Series Committee, who have worked together with the office, the dean's office staff. Uh, they worked a lot this past weeks, putting together this event, promoting this event, getting everything ready for today. So a round of applause for everybody who worked on this. Thank you very much for putting this together. So I've worked in journalism in the field, in the general field of journalism for about 30 years now, which is a little scary. I started early. Uh, and first in the newspaper, TV, as a reporter, as a magazine reporter and editor. I did a lot of environmental reporting when I lived in Brazil. And then as a professor and now as a dean at the school. And so I'm not exaggerating when I say that most of my life has been dedicated to journalism and mass communication. But in those last few years, in the street decades, I've seen a lot of change. I think I've seen a lot of uh, the transformation that has been going on, first as a participant, and now also as a participant, but as an educator, as an administrator. And I think we have all seen these changes that are going on in the industry. And some of those changes seem to be coming faster and faster as the, the technology changes, for example, the platform change. Uh, the school seeks to prepare students to face these challenges and to be ready to the market, to be ready for the market, to work in the field. But we often ask the questions, you know, what is the future of journalism? What is the next big change that's coming over the horizon? Will journalism survive as we've always known it, or will it need constantly uh, to change, to adapt to the new technologies, the new ways of communicating, to social media, to content marketing, and to many other things that are changing the industry. These are tough questions. I don't think anybody he here has a definitive answer to those questions, but there are some professionals, however, who are very well positioned to take you know, uh, a good guess on what's going on, to uh, uh, provide their interpretation to what's going on and help answer some of those questions. 
sessions. Uh, Martin Barron is one of them. Uh, Barron became the executive editor of the Washington Post on January 2nd, 2013. He oversees the Post print and digital news operations and a staff of about 650 journalists. In 2014, the Post won two Pulitzer Prizes, one in the category of public service, for revelations of secret surveillance by the National Security Agency, and the other in explanatory journalism for a story about food stamps in America. Previously to the Post, Barron had been the editor of the Boston Globe, and during his 11 and a half years there, the Globe won six Pulitzer Prizes for public service, explanatory journalism, national reporter, reporting, and criticism. Besides this illustrious career, however, Marty has been at the center of at one of the biggest and most recent shifts in the field of journalism, the purchase of the Washington Post by Amazon's founder, Jeff Bezos. Bezos has said that he intends to turn the Post into a national publication and that he's going to use Amazon to help achieve that goal. How will he do that? Is his model one that will be replicated by other papers? Are we going to see other sources of news pivot towards online and mobile formats? If anybody can speak with authority on this and many other questions affecting the future of journalism is Mar Marty Barron. No pressure there, Marty. But we're all looking forward to getting those answers in your presentation. After Barron's presentation, he'll be joined on stage, or he'll be joined on stage now by Rick Hirsch, who is the managing editor of the Miami Herald in a South Florida institution in his own right, having worked here as a reporter and editor for 34 years. Rick is responsible for the day-to-day -day oversight of the Herald's new content, in print, news content in print and digital platforms, and has played a key role in the news organization's shift to digital news and video. These two gentlemen have a wealth of knowledge, inside and experience to share with us here today, and we are honored to have them speak. Please join me in welcoming them to FIU, and we'll begin today's event by welcoming Marty Barron. Well, thank you, Raul. I appreciate that very kind introduction, and uh, especially thank you for calling me a gentleman. I'm not always called that uh, under other circumstances, so I really appreciate it on this occasion. And thank you to all of you for inviting me to uh, join you today. Uh, this is a school that I've watched for, for many years. I've watched it grow and, and mature. First, when I was a reporter at the, at the Miami Herald in the late uh, 1970s. That was shortly after the university opened in 1972, and then as editor of the Miami Herald in 2000, 2001. So I've always had a fondness, fondness for FIU. Uh, uh, from what I've seen, the students uh, come with no sense of entitlement and few, if any, inherited advantages. They come only with their aspirations and the goal of achievement, and they rely on hard work, ingenuity, a spirit of possibility, and a determination to seize on opportunity. So for those who are entering the field of media, those are the qualities that you are going to need. Because if you get the sense that everything must be earned and nothing will be given to you, that nothing will come easy, then your expectations are just right for this field. You enter at a time of uh, upheaval. Nothing in media, not journalism, not advertising, not communications of any type remains at rest. It is not what it was 10 years ago. It is not what it was five years ago. It is not what it will be five years from now or even two. That turbulence can be unsettling. There's a certain seasickness or air sickness which is familiar to all of us who work in the profession. But the upheaval means unparalleled opportunities for those who are willing to learn what they need and know that the learning must never stop. Many, many veterans in the field will check out, weary, frustrated, maybe upset. But you can check in if you're smart about it. To enter this field now 
there is perhaps only one inescapable requirement. You must be an optimist. Now, I made this point earlier this year in a previous speech at another university. It received more attention than I could have imagined. To me, the idea did not seem so radical. Yet perhaps it really was when you consider the buyouts and the layoffs, when you hear from those who wish all the change would just stop. Well, the change won't stop. And what I said in that previous speech is what I'll say again today. There is no acceptable alternative to optimism. And here's why. If you get into this arena, you will be required to recognize opportunities and to seize on them. You can only do this if you anticipate that you will succeed. If you are not optimistic, why would you work to succeed? What use would it be? And if you are not working to succeed, no matter the challenges that you face, you are not working as you should. That does not mean that your goals will be easy to accomplish. You may fail a few times before you attain them. What you tried first may not be the best idea. You will have to try again, but you must keep trying. I am optimistic, and I am proud to work at an organization that is experimenting in all sorts of ways. Not certain that everything will work, but confident that some will. And when we find things that w don't work, we'll try something else. We'll do that without feeling embarrassed that something didn't go right, without worrying what pundits say. We'll move ahead without any sense of defeat. We'll take the next step with the knowledge that obstacles are not permanent barriers. Obstacles exist to be overcome. Now, there's a quote that I like, and it comes from the winner of a Nobel Peace Prize. Dr. Bernard, Bernard Laun, who won the prize in 1985, was a founder of International Physicians for Peace. And he was an advocate of a continued moratorium on nuclear testing. And here's what he said. Only those who see the invisible can do the impossible. And the point is this. What seems impossible is possible. And what today is not visible can be imagined, can be pursued, and gives us purpose. Now, honesty requires those of us in media to acknowledge that we have missed opportunities, moved too slowly, and at times stubbornly resisted the inevitable. But in this field, and people forget this, we've also overcome a lot. And that should give us confidence that we can overcome the obstacles that confront us today. More than two decades ago, while I was a senior editor at the Los Angeles Times, our top editor hosted a lunch for entrepreneur Ted Turner. He had just created CNN, the first 24-hour news network. He was proud, understandably so. His new network promised to shake up the media landscape. He had many doubters. He expected to defy them. Now, the Los Angeles Times provided our distinguished guest a wonderful meal. But that hospitality did not keep Ted Turner from speaking his mind. Nothing ever did. He bluntly told the journalists who were hosting him, in 10 years, you will be out of business. Now, by Turner's figuring, this would happen because he was going to make it happen with his 24-hour cable news network. Well, Ted Turner was wrong. Our industry and our prof profession survived 24-hour cable news. We're still, still doing good work. We're still a major force in the media ecosystem. We're still setting the news agenda for our communities and the country. But we have to admit, it has been a really r tough stretch. And it's worth recalling just how disruptive the forces in the media industry have been, and just how recent. What changed everything for us? It was not 24-hour cable news. It was high-speed broadband. And that only became pervasive in the middle of the last decade, 2004, 2005. It allowed super-fast internet connections. 
It allowed photos to load fast and allowed instant viewing of videos. And perhaps most urgently today, it allows mobile connection to the web. So let's look at what happened and look how fast. Google wasn't, was not founded until 1998 and did not go public until 2004. Google News did not come out of beta until 2006. And today, there are more than 3 billion searches a day on Google. Facebook was founded in 2004. Now it has more than 1.3 billion monthly active users. YouTube was founded in 2005. More than a billion people now visit YouTube each month. More than 6 billion hours of video are watched every month. Twitter was founded in 2006. A half billion tweets are sent every day. Kindle was introduced in 2007. Last year, three in 10 Americans read an ebook. Apple introduced the iPhone in just June 2007. We're now getting close to 2 billion smartphone users worldwide. Instagram was founded in 2009. The iPad was introduced in January 2010. Vine was just started two years ago, and then with only three employees, was quickly bought by Twitter. So there you go. That's what we've seen in just the last decade. Is change like that fast enough for you? Things will probably get faster. The new media landscape has led to a migration of the public away from traditional sources of news. Maybe you find your news on Facebook, founded only a decade ago, or on Twitter, or on Google News, or some new website like BuzzFeed, or TMZ, or Vice. In many instances, on Google, Facebook, or Twitter, for example, it's the news of traditional news organizations you're reading. But you're spending most of your time on those sites instead of ours. They are your first stop and the place you return. And so you may have little or no loyalty to any one news brand. The omnipresent nature of the internet in our lives has also led to a migration of advertisers. Classified advertising has virtually disappeared. Craigslist alone has drained a huge amount of lucrative classified advertising away from newspapers. Other print advertising followed classifieds off the cliff. Google is an advertising powerhouse. You're doing a search on a product, a company selling that product now knows of your interest, and ads can appear with your search. In fact, those ads can follow you as you travel around the web. If Facebook and Google are where people tend to go first, they will attract a huge share of advertising. And that's what has happened and continues to happen. What gave rise to our industry, the printing press, also once shielded us from competitors. It was expensive to build presses, buy paper, buy ink, buy delivery trucks. Delivering news and information now doesn't require any of that. You can be an international television network by turning on the camera that comes with your computer or phone. You can be your own publisher. Now things won't get any easier because the pace at which we're becoming a digital society is accelerating. Information is going to become fully mobile, and the economics of mobile are even more uncertain than what we've seen to date with the web. Our field will become more competitive, and just as economic theory would predict, profit ma margins will stay low, financial pressures will intensify. Yet our survival to date, despite an onslaught of technological change, suggests we have considerable strengths, more than many would have thought. We have been more resilient than people give us credit for. We have been more resilient than we give ourselves credit for. Still, there's no room for self-satisfaction, for self-congratulation, for complacency. We cannot live in the past. This game of survivor is not over, not by a long shot. And the goal of enduring profitability remains just that, a goal. We must look ahead. We have no choice. And we have no choice but to innovate and experiment. There will be no one thing 
no silver bullet to quote unquote save journalism. The answers, I believe, will be found in our doing many things. And though, so, and though some keep wondering why someone hasn't concocted the magic solution, in truth, our future does not depend on dreaming up something uniquely spectacular. So here's a little fact, here's a little fact for you, and I'm not the first to mention it. We put a man on the moon before we put wheels on luggage. And yet wheels on luggage, this unexciting act of innovation, actually changed lives. They have dramatically improved the experience of travelers. They transformed the luggage industry that had previously changed little, and they were a commercial success. They are now standard equipment. So what's the lesson there? Our industry does not require a moonshot. We might just need something like wheels on luggage and a few other things like that. Success in digital media is not uniquely available to a new breed of prophets, mystics, and geniuses. It's available to all of us if we adapt smartly and urgently and enthusiastically to what readers want and need in a new information environment. Now, no doubt you want to know what skills you'll need to be successful. A lot should, by now, be obvious. Let's just stipulate, for those of you who intend to be journalists, that you must learn how to report well, fairly, honestly, accurately, digging beneath the surface of the real story, for the real story, holding government and powerful interests of all types accountable to citizens, consumers, workers, the vast majority of people. Let's just stipulate that you need to know how to write, how to string words together so that your ideas and message are clear, and at best, so that your use of language engages, enthralls, excites those who read you, so that you draw people deep into a world apart from their own, so that, so that they see things in a fresh light, so that what you write provokes wonder and thought. Let's just stipulate that you need to be curious about the world around you, that you're more intrigued by what you don't know than impressed by what you know, that you have an appetite to gain real insights wherever you can. Let's also stipulate that you need to learn contemporary skills of video, audio, basic coding, data collection and analysis, how to make your own charts, things of that sort. These are now tools of the profession, and your journalistic carpentry will be incomplete, even deficient, without them. Let's just stipulate that you must master new forms of storytelling that have emerged, that draw upon data visualization, and video, and interactive graphics, and links, and supplemental material for readers who wish to know more. Let's just stipulate that you need to be comfortable with the contemporary ways people receive and process information, that you will need to be expert in social media, how to use it as a reporting tool, and how to use it to promote your stories, because promoting your stories, your own stories, is now your own responsibility. Let's just stipulate that the web is a different medium, that it calls for an approach that is different from newspapers. Just as radio required an approach that was different from newspapers, and TV required an approach that was different from radio. And I'd add, delivering information on mobile devices may demand an approach that is different from the way we've done things on the desktop computer. Now I say let's just stipulate to all that for a reason. Because all of that is no longer in question. If you were wondering about any of it, wonder no longer. Now, what's not often said is that our field will require a different kind of person. We will require more than just employees. That's what we needed in the past. Now, we will need entrepreneurs. Journalists will have to be entrepreneurs. You will be creating entirely new companies, or you will be working in entrepreneurial ventures that will constantly expect inspired and innovative ideas. You will have to become an entrepreneur 
within larger organizations too, because they need to compete with startups and smaller, more nimble outfits. And because you will be asked to transform organizations that have stood strong for decades, but now worry endlessly about making it through tomorrow. You will need to understand your own readership, to help build it, to market your own work. The demand for journalistic entrepreneurs with all the right skills I talked about is big and growing. Media is an everyday growing part of our lives. And the media industry, writ large, is growing too. Don't let the anguish you hear from certain corners of our business fool you. Don't let it discourage you or dissuade you from pursuing your passion. New journalism outfits are popping up all over, capital is available to fund them, and older journalistic institutions feel ever greater urgency to remake themselves for the digital era we all inhabit. It used to be you had to wait in the back of the line for an amazingly good job in our field. Now you can move with astonishing speed to the front. You really can. It used to be we would hire people who could learn from us. Now we hire people who can teach us something we don't know. And we have a lot to learn. We have to learn it fast. And you have an opportunity, if you do the right things, to be one of those people our industry absolutely must have. Finally, let me talk about something that almost never gets mentioned in a discussion of the future of journalism. It happens to be the most important thing that remains the same. In fact, it is the most important thing of all, and it is this. Nothing is more important than having a good idea. Even more important than the fancy tools you, you use will be the thinking you do. More important than the mechanics of our business will be your own mind. You cannot deliver a good story without a good idea for one, and good ideas about how to construct that story. You cannot have a successful new product if it is not rooted in a smart idea. Now somehow this has gotten lost in a world consumed with metrics, the discipline of measuring how well we're performing. It is not that we don't need metrics, we do. But metrics focus on results. The idea is where you start. Metrics can tell you how you did, but they will not tell you what to work on. To do that, you will need imagination, creativity, resourcefulness, insight. You will need a good idea. You will have to take your mind to work, and that you will have to put your mind to work. Never set it to autopilot. Never leave it in sleep mode. Every day, give your mind a workout, because good, good ideas will matter above all. Thank you again for inviting me. Now we find out if these mics work. How's that? Thanks, Marty. Is that, sorry. Is that working? Yes. Are we, are we live? I think we are. OK. Well, thanks. Congratulations. And Thank thanks for that, those inspiring words uh, for all of us, um, uh, newbies and those of us who've been at this for a while. Um, so I thought what we would do um, is start with a little bit of question and answer that I'll lead and then um, go out to any of you who have some questions. Um, this is a rare opportunity. The editor of the Washington Post doesn't amble by every day, so we shouldn't squander it. Um, and you talked a lot, Marty, about um, the changes in media and uh, the way um, we need to deliver content differently on different uh, platforms and how that's become everyone's job. And um, there was a point back 
um, several years ago when um, I believe you were at the Globe and I was at the Herald. We were at the same week-long conference on change in media. And I remember there being some, there was conversations about crowdsourcing and use of social media and there were some tense moments and you were a part of some of them about how media need, needed to change. Um, where was the point for you where you kind of made, was there a point where you made a pivot and realized uh, some old rules don't apply or? I don't know that there was any one, one moment. Yes. Uh, okay, so. Um, In deference to Eric uh, Newton from the Knight Foundation, I think you paid for it. I paid for this thing. Yeah. The idea was that uh, editor, the idea was that editors need training just as much as reporters need training. And that was my idea, actually, that, uh, that Knight kindly, kindly funded. Um, so uh, maybe it was in that discussion. I don't know. It's been more of a, a fast evolution, I think, uh, a realization that, look, I mean, we can't be blind to the fact that this is where readers are going, right? So um, we should be paying attention to where readers are going, and where readers are going is where we should go. And then the question is, well, what do they need? And how do we prepare for that? And one of the things that, that it was the genesis for that project is that I f myself felt insufficiently ready uh, and insufficiently well capable of leading a news organization uh, toward what we needed to do, because I didn't really know uh, what, what works, what doesn't work, how do you change a culture, how does one go about that? And so I felt the need to have some discussion about what, what, what's really necessary. And so after that, uh, uh, John Yama, who was the head of our digital operation at the, at the Boston Globe at the time, and I went back and we developed, developed a plan. And I forget how many points it had, maybe half a dozen or so, of different things that we needed to do. Uh, what equipment we needed, what kind of retraining we needed, that sort of thing. We talked to our senior editors, then we went department by department and showed them our plan and said, okay, let's get going. Now, one of the things we realized is just, just in terms of basic equipment, we didn't have what we needed. So we wanted to do video. We did not have a single camera in our newsroom. Uh, our parent company wanted us to do video. They did not provide us a single camera to do video. We were actually borrowing uh, one staffer's camera in order to do video. So clearly there was an urgency to us doing that. But it was more important than that, and there were other things to be done. And I don't think even then I realized all of the kinds of things that needed to be done. And I think the greater realization is what I talked about earlier, and that is that it came later, and that is this is just a different medium. Uh, let's just recognize that. Uh, you know, when television came about, uh, broadcasters would write was what was essentially a newspaper story, and then they would read that on the air, and it didn't make for very good television. And that people quickly realized that, and then they created a sort of a language and a form of communication that works on television. And we have to create a language and a form of communication that works on, uh, that works on the web, and I think we know what that is. It's a much more conversational uh, style, f far more accessible. It incorporates different elements, including photo, and tweets, and, tweets and uh, what? Is that on? Hello? Is it going out? Is that my fault? Hello? Is that working? Okay. So, uh, that we needed all of those, that we needed all a different form of, of communication. And so that's what we, that's, that's what we've done. And uh, that's what we, that's what I recognize, and I think that's what we recognize at the Post. Are you active on Twitter? I, you, were, you were dinged once for being a little bit of a latecomer to the Twitter. Uh, I was what was called a lurker. Um, <laughs> I wasn't so late as much as I was but hidden. By the way, uh, at, so, at Post Baron. Um, right, at Post Baron. You can all sign up. At Rick Hirsch. Uh, uh, so uh, I wasn't that late, actually. I mean, I was a little bit late. I was a little reluctant because in this field these days, if you, do, if you make one mistake for a person in my position or your position or Mindy's position, you make one mistake, your career is over. Uh, you say something that you shouldn't say. And on Twitter, it's out and it's all to the world. And I didn't, maybe it was an act of self-preservation on my part that I simply did not want to put myself in a position where I might say something that, uh, that I shouldn't have said and then I would pay the consequences for it. So I wanted to see what it was all about first, and I wanted to lurk, and I did lurk, and then finally, you know, I sort of, you know, revealed myself as a, as a person on Twitter and became much more active, and I've been pretty active. So I'm not tweeting 10 times a day. I don't have things to say 10 times a day. So, um, but 
I f generally focus on what's happening in the media field. I don't uh, generally just promote our own stories and things like that, and I'm not providing commentary on the news. Uh, I generally focus on what's happening in the media world. That's the area that I, I focus on. Okay. Um, so um, you didn't mention uh, your new publisher in your speech, but um, the dean did, uh, and uh, there was a lot of buzz when Jeff Bezos uh, bought the Washington Post. Uh, and in the last couple of months, um, Politico said uh, that the, I think on the Jeff Bezos, Marty Baron regime, had, quoting here, no major, produced no major digital innovation, no radical new product launch, no change to delivery or presentation, and no promise of any specific plan for the future. Now, right. David Carr, um, just a few weeks ago, uh, came back and said uh, that the Post is in the middle of a great run. Uh, it's turning out the kind of reporting that journalists and media live for, uh, and it's the resurgence of the Washington Post. So um, do you, uh, I would say, uh, fi find the truth in both of those? David Carr. <laughs> uh, look, I mean, I, that was a very gratifying column that he wrote. Uh, I do think that the, the Politico piece was wrong-headed, and I told the writer so. Uh, there has been an enormous amount of innovation. We've had an enormous number of initiatives, and it's what's driven our, uh, we could not have achieved the traffic growth that we've achieved without that kind of innovation. Uh, we have seen month-to-month -month increases in, uh, in unique visitors, ranging from 35 to 65% per month. Uh, we hit, uh, two months ago, we had 42 million unique visitors. And as, as David pointed out, somewhat closing the gap between us and the, and the New York Times. And we continue to grow. And I would, uh, if things continue with the way they are this month, I would hope that we would be even higher uh, this month. That's been phenomenal growth. That did not, not, not happen with no innovation, nothing new, that sort of thing. What I think that uh, uh, the political writer was looking for was the silver bullet that I said is never going to exist, uh, some sort of magic cure, as if uh, Jeff Bezos had in his pocket uh, that he was going to pull out sort of this thing that he had been hiding from the entire universe and would suddenly reveal it after his acquisition of the post. The thing is, is that when Jeff Bezos bought us, he said very publicly, uh, uh, because it was a town hall meeting at our, at, our, at, at our place that was tweeted widely and somebody even surreptitiously recorded it, he said quite, uh, quite openly he didn't have such a thing, that what we ought to do is experiment with a lot of things. We should try a lot of things, and he would provide a so-called runway uh, to see what worked and what didn't work. And that's exactly what he has done, as he's given us the opportunity to experiment in a lot of different ways, and um, particularly in terms of sort of that communication that is web-specific and, and suited to the web, customized to the web. And we've hired a lot of people who are essentially web natives who grew up writing first for the web and have a knack for it. It's not just second nature, it's first nature. And, um, and so, um, and we've innovated uh, in a lot of, I think in a lot of different ways. And we have more to come, by the way, uh, as you will, I think, see. Um, so, uh, but it's not a magic cure, none of this is. And I think anybody who is, who is waiting for that is, is delusional um, and is wrong-headed. And he said he didn't have that, he didn't have it. He never said he was going to deliver that. He said he would deliver experimentation. And it's that experimentation that has led to phenomenal traffic growth at the Washington Post that has caused the industry, I think, to take notice. There's also been a great run of stories. Uh, it, it seems, from a distance, that the Post has been um, more aggressive uh, outside of Washington, um, very involved covering the Ferguson story, for example. Um, uh, uh, talk a little bit about some of the stories that have helped drive that traffic. Sure. Um, Secret Service. Secret Service. I mean, look, we, underlying all of this change, we have to be good journalists. We have to pursue good stories. We have to recognize the importance of the good idea, of the important idea, of the important, the important story, and, and deploy appropriately for it. And, and we have. You know, last year was the NSA story that was uh, a phenomenon uh, for us and The Guardian. Uh, and Snowden, through an intermediary, approached us both, uh, and we were both producing uh, consistently revelations about, uh, about the 
extensive and intrusive surveillance by the National Security Agency. Uh, this year, you know, it's been a, a number of stories, coverage of Ferguson, as you mentioned, coverage of the Secret Service, uh, revelations about that. Uh, today in testimony, the uh, interim head of the Secret Service acknowledged uh, massive deficiencies uh, that needed to be, to be addressed uh, at the service. Um, we just, uh, we're trying to cover a lot of things and cover them well and cover them aggressively. And we had a big project on what's known as asset forfeiture, the ability of uh, local police to uh, basically stop a driver that they believe, for whatever reason, is carrying a lot of cash. And if they are carrying a lot of cash to, to make the assumption that uh, it's illegally obtained, uh, and then just simply to seize that cash, and you then have to prove that it wasn't illegally, that, that it was not illegally obtained in order to get it back. Uh, and in many instances, these are small business owners who deal in cash, people who won their a bunch of money at, in Las Vegas or something like that, all sorts of reasons that people carry cash or they don't, they just like to carry cash. And, and they were completely innocent, and they had, to, they had their money essentially stolen from them by law enforcement and they had to fight to get it back at great expense to themselves. That was a fantastic project. Um, so you mentioned Ferguson, well I mentioned Ferguson, you mentioned Ferguson, you've got a lot of uh, young reporters out here who at some point in their careers may find themselves in a difficult situation covering police. Uh, you had a reporter, Wes Lowry, uh, on that story who suddenly found himself becoming the story, uh, kind of snapped up with a TV reporter for um, I guess spending too much time on his laptop at McDonald's. Um, how, any advice for reporters in situations like that, for editors who may have reporters in situations like that? Right. Well, Wes is a wonderful, young, ta talented young reporter. Um, we hired from the Boston Globe. He had been an intern for us. Um, He's very conscious of social media. He has a large Twitter following, I think something like 100,000 followers already, and he's in his early 20s or something like that. Uh, so um, he was covering Ferguson. He was in a uh, McDonald's, I guess it was, and, um, and he, was, he was kind of arrested for being there, um, and, uh, which is a new charge, I guess. But uh, he was there. He was recharging his uh, equipment. And uh, there were a lot of protesters who were also just in the, in, in the McDonald's. And the police came in, instructed everybody to leave. He had the uh, good sense, I think, to simply pull out his iPhone and start filming. And, um, and just started filming what was happened. And then the police uh, told him not to do that, which is illegal in itself. Uh, you're certainly allowed to film what the law enforcement is doing. And, um, and then he, in fact, did agree to leave. He was leaving, and, uh, and then they arrested him. And um, now, you know, I think it's very important in those circumstances to, to, to modulate what you do in social media, to make sure that you're not becoming part of the story. Sometimes it's unavoidable to, um, because you are part of the story. If the police arrest you for no good reason, then, uh, then you're going to be part of the story. And, um, uh, it's a very tricky, it's a very tricky thing, and then you have to make sure that you're covering all aspects of the story and hearing everybody out and being fair and all of that. And I think Wes was, but it was a very charged, it was a very charged situation. And, um, and um, you know, we would hope that reporters generally won't be arrested for doing their jobs, uh, which is covering law enforcement and covering uh, protests of one type or another, both peaceful and some not so peaceful. Okay. Um, you've been involved in a lot of big stories. I want to ask you quickly about a few of them. Um, uh, when you were executive editor at the Miami Herald, um, you had oversight of two really important stories in South Florida's history, country's history. One was the Ilian Gonzalez case. The other was the 2000 presidential election uh, and the bad count in Florida. And um, uh, you made decisions in both of those cases uh, that were both controversial uh, and uh, important in coverage. Can you talk a little bit about them? Uh, what's the controversial decision you're thinking of in terms of El Young? Um, well, the Herald's coverage was... Right. Well, the Herald's coverage was controversial. It was intensely controversial. There were strong opinions uh, about it uh, at the time, obviously. Um, 
um, you know, Cuban Americans here uh, were felt very strongly about this a kid situation. Uh, they felt that he had finally begin, been given the freedom that he deserved. It's as, as if somebody threw a kid over the Berlin Wall, finally to freedom, and what was being suggested was throwing the kid back over the Berlin Wall to uh, to a totalitarian system. Uh, a lot of uh, Anglo's, in particular, uh, felt that well, this was this kid. Uh, didn't belong to these uncles who were living here in Miami, that he belonged to his father who was living in Cuba, and uh, that he should be returned to his father, and that this was a family situation, that, uh, that he should not be separated from his family, even though his mother uh, brought him here. So, you know, every day I would come into work, and uh, the, the little message light was lit up on my phone, and I would pick it up. One message would be about how I was pandering to, we were pandering to Cubans here in, in uh, Miami, and, and the next message was about how I was anti-Cuban. Um, and they were talking about the same story. Uh, it was kind of interesting uh, to hear that. We also had, you know, to be honest, we had tremendous tensions in our own newsroom. Um, as you may recall, and as Mindy I'm sure recalls, she was in the middle of it at the time. Uh, you know, at one moment we had a staffer uh, who made a joke. Uh, what he said was joke, uh, I think it was joke, um, uh, but it did not go over well uh, with Cuban Americans on our staff. And um, there was an uproar about the whole thing and uh, demands for meetings with me and all that sort of stuff and maybe demands that he be fired and that, that kind of stuff. And uh, we didn't fire him, but we did tell him, you know, that not to do this. And, we, and I uh, gave instructions that during this entire coverage, we were under ex examination just as much as, uh, as everybody else was, as the government was, as the community was, everybody else, and that we should not be making jokes of any type about this story uh, because we would be then become the story. And then word went out that Marty Barron had declared that there would be no jokes in the, no joke telling in the newsroom, um, uh, which was not the case. I did not say that there should be no jokes in the newsroom, but I did say on that particular story, we were not going to be telling any jokes because it would lead to bad consequences for us and it would suggest that we had a particular point of view which we didn't have and we wanted to be able to cover it accurately and fairly and honestly, but uh, we did not want to be perceived as, ha as taking any side and having any bias on that story. Um, on the, on the uh, presidential election of 2000, uh, obviously the vote was in dispute um, and um, I mean, the, the Bush campaign thought it was a good vote, a, 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 a good uh, vote. So um, they were perfectly happy with how it first ended up. Um, but ultimately, you know, the Florida Supreme Court had ordered a recount, but the U.S. Supreme Court had said that there would be no recount. There would be no recount, and we decided at the Miami Herald that uh, we would conduct our own recount. That all the ball ballots were be were considered to be public records. At least that was our assumption, and the courts ultimately held that held up that concept. And, uh, and we would go examine every single ballot cast in Florida, in all of the 67 counties in Florida. Uh, I think that's the right count, 67 counties in Florida. Uh, all 67 counties in Florida, and we would go county by county uh, and count them all ourselves, uh, and we did that. Now, uh, Tony Ritter, who was then the chief executive of Knight Ritter, which then owned the Miami Herald, uh, wanted us to uh, align ourselves with a major accounting firm. Uh, we did that after one accounting firm after the next said we, they didn't want any part of this. Uh, we were complete, it was a completely radioactive subject for them. Um, but one finally said they would do it, and we went at considerable expense uh, to every county. It cost us uh, over $850,000 uh, to do that project, um, which was a little bit above my estimate to Tony that it would cost us $250,000. <laughs> <clears throat> but thankfully, he paid the entire bill and did not complain, and I did not lose my job over that slight, slightly wrong estimate about what the costs would be. And the result was? And the result was that we determined that, that uh, for the ballots that counted, that could be counted, uh, that is where people didn't vote for two people, where uh, all of that, for the ballots that could actually be counted, not the ballots in Palm Beach County where there was confusion and people who wanted to vote for Gore ended up voting for Pat Buchanan, uh, that for all the votes that could legitimately be counted, 
that almost certainly Bush won in Florida uh, by a not huge, but a meaningful margin. So another major story you oversaw um, was the priest abuse scandals in Boston. And um, that's now going to be subject of a major motion picture. Uh, and Lee Shriver has been Lief. picked Lief. to play you. Do they have the casting right? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I think so. He's, uh, I, you know, I'm not the one to judge. Uh, you can judge um, better than I can. Uh, I'm going up uh, on, on Friday, actually, to see the last day of filming in Toronto. So um, that'll, be, that'll be really interesting. He's an incredibly uh, smart, thoughtful actor. He's done great work. Um, and uh, I'm just honored to be portrayed by him. Um, Do you watch Ray I, Donovan? Uh, I have watched Ray Donovan, you know. Um, I'm not as tough as he is. I, I don't break risks quite the way he does. In fact, I'm not sure I've broken any risks except maybe metaphorically. And um, I, um, uh, anyway, it's, it's gonna be, there's a great cast. Uh, Michael Keaton is in there, Stanley Tucci, um, you know, just a tremendous uh, Mark Ruffalo, people like that. So uh, you can all watch for it. It's coming out, I think, in the fall of 2015. So why don't we, uh, if, if anyone has some questions they would like to ask of Marty, we've got mics set up. Why don't you come up and get to a mic? It's a, bit, a, little. It's a shy group. Okay, we're, we're, we've got someone way in the back. You can tell it's winter in Florida. Yeah, really. Okay, well, um, hello. I have a question, and I came a little late because I had a class, and maybe you answered this already. But um, as an undergraduate, what were you doing that prepared you for your career now? Uh, well, I studied journalism. Um, I didn't know that I was going to study journalism initially, but I did want to go to a school that had a journalism program. I went to a school that did not have a very large one, uh, Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It actually only had two professors of journalism. So, um, but I also, at the time, uh, I knew that journalism was becoming more specialized. Um, and so I went to college in 1972. Um, and um, that was my first year. And, um, and I knew that it was becoming more specialized. And I had an interest in business. And um, so I started studying business as well. And uh, they had a, f a program, a five-year program, where, where you could get an undergraduate degree in journalism and a graduate degree in, in a graduate MBA. And uh, I decided to pursue that program. I saw that uh, I had a lot of AP credits, and so I saw that I could, if I worked it right, I could get both degrees uh, in four years. But I would have had to start taking my graduate studies before I actually got an undergraduate degree. So I applied for a waiver so that I could take graduate courses before having an undergraduate degree. And thankfully, they granted that waiver. Um, the faculty on the day of graduation apparently noticed that this had occurred and were outraged uh, that anyone would have been allowed to take graduate courses before getting the undergraduate degree. And I, I'm not sure they've ever done it again, uh, but uh, too late. I, had, I, got both, I got both degrees on the same day, picking up a BA in journalism and, a, and an MBA on the, on the same day after four years. So that prepared me in a lot of different ways. Um, it prepared me to, with a specialty in business reporting. I knew a lot about business, and, and I knew what to look for. And when I came to the Miami Herald, well, I started in a bureau that they then had in Stewart, uh, and then moved to Boca Raton, uh, Boca Raton Delray Beach Bureau. Um, uh, they quickly moved me to be a business reporter in Miami. They did not have a very large business staff at the time. They had uh, four people in the business staff. They didn't have a separate business section or anything like that. But business became a growth area in, in journalism at the time. It really exploded. And uh, that was a great opportunity for me. So it's, I caught the wave. And that was fantastic. And then later on, as I, uh, as I went into management and I had to deal with people on our business side, uh, the advertising people, the circulation people, the finance people, all of those marketing people. I was able to speak their language. I was actually able to understand their language and uh, because it's a different language frequently and a lot of words that are just like invented. Um, and, um, but also to understand, not be intimidated by numbers and not be intimidated by dealing with people on the business side and, 
And I think that that, and also understanding what the business, underst I, I understood what the business imperatives were in our, in, in our, in our world. I was not removed from that, uh, like many people in our industry at the time were. And so that really helped. I hope I'm not taking up too much time, but can I ask the squad a second question? Sure, <laughs> go ahead. What was, between all that time, what was that pivotal moment where you really fell in love with journalism? Working on the school paper. Uh, I, I immediately started working on the school paper and, and I loved doing that. I loved being a reporter and I, uh, and I became editor in my junior year and I loved being, I loved being editor. Mm -hmm. uh, so I loved having an impact on the entire, on the entire product. And uh, just the opportunity to go talk to people you wouldn't be able to talk to otherwise, the, the ability to sort of tell the truth when not everybody was telling the truth. Um, the, uh, the craft of writing uh, was attractive to me as, as well. I always liked that. Um, and, uh, and also the sort of uh, the sense of community within a newsroom uh, is really something exceptional. Uh, I don't think that you will find it in too many other professions where uh, you know, you walk around and there's the expert and somebody knows everything about sports and somebody else knows everything about film and the other person knows everything about law enforcement and, I mean, even within our small uh, journalism world there at uh, Lehigh University, there were so many people who knew a lot about a lot of different things that I didn't know anything about. But just to be able to have access to people like that and make friends, uh, uh, there was a real sort of bond uh, that was established there. Thank you. My name is Amanda Rabinez. Maybe, maybe you'll hear again. Okay. <laughs> All right. Very good. That's very good. Thank you, Amanda. Another quality you need. Don't be shy. Uh, so that's good. Hi. My name is Alex Blanco. Um, first of all, thank you for coming. I thank really you. appreciate it. Um, I have a question. Uh, what do you think about um, comical news shows like John Oliver and John Stewart and Stephen Colbert? And what kind of advice can you offer students who are looking to pursue those kinds of uh, journalism and media. Those kinds of shows? You mean to be working those kinds of shows? Well, I don't know that I have a lot of advice about how to get jobs in those things because I, you know, I'm more likely to be the subject of ridicule than I am likely to be the person giving it on a show like that. So, um, I, um, I mean, what do I think of the shows? I think they're great. They're entertaining. They, they involve people in the news in a way that is unconventional. I think that's great. I think it would be imp it's important for people who watch those and for, for whom that's the seemingly primary source of news that maybe they should consider checking out some other sources too. Um, and I think that would, be, that would be very important to do. Have that, maybe have that be the start, but keep going and uh, research these subjects from other, from other sources. Uh, you know, the John Stewart and Colbert and all his, he's moving on. But, um, and John Oliver, they're not the be all and end all, they're a form of entertainment primarily, uh, but also it's informational, and it's, but it's informational with the, their objective of advocacy at the same time. So I think it's just important to sort of use that and then go do your own research and come to your own opinions about things um, and check out a lot of different sources. As for getting, as I said, for getting jobs there, I have no idea. Um, I have no idea. So. Um, I also have another question. Um, for students who are just graduating from college and um, are even pursuing their masters or are going into the world of journalism, in this world of changing media culture, uh, how, what kind of advice can you offer students who are looking to bring the traditional print media into this new world? Well, a lot of what I talked about in, the, in, in my remarks, uh, I just think that you, um, you need to understand how people are consuming information these days. I love print as much as anybody. Uh, I mean, I grew up with print. Uh, there's a lot that I like about it. But the reality is that most people, particularly of your generation and frankly of even older generations, are not getting their information that way. So you need to learn how people are actually getting their information. Uh, you know, even for a lot of students, I was talking to somebody earlier today about this. I mean, even for a lot of students today, they love to just have their name in print. There's something tactile there. It's, uh, it's, and it means so much more to them than the fact that it's just on the, on the web. Uh, and that's all great, but um, you have to keep in mind not what is your own, what gives you yourself satisfaction, but what gives the consumer and the reader satisfaction. And most readers are going, are getting their information on the web, and it's absolutely critical that you understand that, understand that thoroughly, and, and do terrific journalism, but uh, shape it in a way that it works in that medium. 
Thank you so much. Sure. Okay. Hi, my name is. Oh, this is tall. Pull it down. There you go. There we go. Oh. <laughs> Hi, my name is Vini Boston. I have two questions for you. In this day and age, what type of journal, like, what do you think journalism is at the moment? Like, if you could give it another name, what would you name it at this moment? Um, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't give it another name. In fact, I, I, I've made, I like the word journalism because it means, um, because it means uh, that we, we are actually, there's a, it, journalism involves the process of verification, which a lot of stuff does not. Uh, it means finding what is the deeper story. Uh, why did something happen? How did it happen? Where is it going now? Not just the, the fact of it, but why, did, why, does, why, did, why is there that fact at, at this moment? What's behind that fact? And what is that fact? What are the implications of that fact for, for other people and for the, for the wider world? That's journalism. So I have an objection when people call it uh, content. I hate that word. Um, I simply hate that word. Uh, I, I've said over and over, you may as well just call it stuff uh, <laughs> because it has no meaning whatsoever. Whereas journalism is a word that does have meaning. It's, uh, you know, we're going to find the actual truth. We're going to find out why things came about, where are they headed, you know, who's behind this, why did this happen? And that's journalism. It's deeper than content. And it's not just filling the space between the ads, okay? Content is filling the space between the ads. Journalism is filling it with something meaningful. Ellen, my second question. Oh. And my second question is for the, how, how do journalists that have an idea for the being, becoming more entrepreneur, you know, becoming entrepreneurs, how do those, journalism, those journalists with ideas get those ideas out? Like, how do they spread it? What would be your advice? I think you need to work with other people. Uh, you need to work, I know that a lot of this happens here. Um, you know, work with computer scientists, work with business people who are studying business, form teams, um, and figure out how to actually create an idea that actually works in the marketplace. It's wonderful to have a great idea, uh, but the idea actually needs to, uh, in man many instances, have a business model attached to it. It needs to, you will know that you have a good idea that appeals to people if people are actually willing to come to it and use it, uh, things like that. So. Work with other people uh, and create teams. We are in an environment right now where we're having to, we work with, uh, we work with uh, developers, uh, engineers who are developers. We work with people in video. We work with interactive graphics people. We work with designers, uh, reporters, photographers, you name it. They're all working together. Every time we have a, a project or even something that's like a mini project or a, even a, just a plain old story, the number of people in the room to actually uh, produce that piece of journalism, it's amazing how many people are in the room uh, because they are the, you know, the coders, coders and the developers and the videographers and the inter informational graphics people and, and the producers and all of these people who are involved. It's not just a, it's not a solitary operation. It's not just one person. So work with other people. Thank you for your time. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, do you think that uh, the fact that multi multinational corporations are start owning media outlets, will that create some type of conflict of interest? Will you feel pressure if you had to cover a story about Amazon or buy it somehow? Well, you know, media companies, I knew this question would come up because I'm on a college campus, so um, uh, it was just fine. So. You know, media companies have been owned by corporations since forever. So corporations or individuals. It was worse in the old days, okay, when you had uh, sort of sole individuals who were like uh, in Los Angeles, you know, you had the Chandler family that owned it and they were, they used their media outlet to actually uh, improve the value, increase the value of land they owned, okay? So um, those, were, those were problematic situations. Right now, do we feel any, let's say, uh, on Amazon, we cover Amazon like anybody else. When Jeff Bezos bought us, he said very explicitly, cover me and cover us as, we, as you would anybody else, and we have. We always disclose that he owns us so that people know that there's a potential conflict of interest and they can evaluate that journalism in that context. Um, you know, there are other times where, um, you know, people have alleged conflicts of interest, which I think are non non-existent. Um, you know, individuals like yourself will have to judge us. Uh, but I'm not sure that there's any alternative. 
realistic alternative to, to, to this. You know, when I look at the journalism, the most impressive journalism that's done out there, it's being done by news organizations that are actually owned by corporations or individuals, indiv individual business people, and they're spending months doing major investigations, the work like what we did on, in Boston, on, which was owned by the New York Times Company at the time, uh, the work we did on the Catholic Church, the work that we did in, in, uh, in, in Washington when we looked at the NSA, was owned by the Washington Post Company, the primary owner, Don Graham at the time. Uh, uh, and, and the work that we've done this year is we've been owned by Jeff Bezos on asset forfeiture. You know, we have the resources to go do that kind of work. We are absolutely determined to do that kind of work. And we have the financial strength that allows us to resist all sorts of pressure uh, that would be brought on a, a one individual. Just to deal with a, a lawsuit, for example, is enormously expensive, mm -hmm. and we have the resources to fight against threatened lawsuits or, or actual lawsuits that are brought. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're going to take one more question. I know class, there's <coughs> two o'clock classes and whatnot. Okay. And so, okay. Congratulations. Sorry, I lost my voice earlier. <laughs> okay. So bear with me. Sure. Um, I want to go back to Ferguson for a second. Uh, when the whole thing, when the whole story broke, and you know there was weeks. Um, where reporters had to cover it. I ended up following Wesley Lowry on Twitter, and I was, um, you know, he was one of the main people that I went to for sources of information. And so I wanted to know, did you agree or disagree? Um, I kind of feel like, as a reporter, as a journalist, when, when he prints stuff and when he publishes stuff through Washington Post, I think it's bad to uh, obviously inject opinion or inject personal views into it, but I think on Twitter, it's a different story because the only thing you can post on Twitter is your personal account because it is his personal account. So I think um, I saw there was other news outlets that were saying they were going to complain to you actually because his Twitter is too opinionated. But how do you feel about that? Because it's his personal account, so he's going to post his personal. Right. Account. Well, you know, it may be his personal account, but anytime somebody is a reporter for us, he's there as a representative of mm -hmm. the Washington Post. Uh, any reporter who is reporting a story is our representative, mm -hmm. all right? I don't care whether they're posting it on their personal Facebook page, they're putting it on their Twitter account, uh, they're uh, sending an email to somebody, you name it. There is no point when a reporter who works for us is relieved of responsibility of representing our institution, all right? So <laughs> at every moment, I think that uh, Wesley or any other reporter is responsible uh, for what they put on Twitter or Facebook or any other social media outlet. So. He did come under some criticism. People did complain. <laughs> uh, uh, there was a lot of back and forth on TV and all of that sort of stuff. You know, I mean, I think that you have to, you know, there was a heated situation and he was in the middle of the story. I think that uh, he understands what, what his responsibilities are uh, in every outlet that he publishes, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook or, or in the actual Washington Post. Um, and, um, you know, and I, I stand behind him, so. Great, thank you. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you, Marty. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it. Dean Rice.